Hello student, I am Dr. Smita Patil, uh, I teach in Department of Gender and Development Studies and today I am going to deliver a lecture on understanding gender based violence. What I am going to do uh, in this lecture, let me explain to you uh, the objective of this lecture. Uh, we will try to understand what is gender based violence, which are the categories of the gender based violence, what are the forms and magnitude of the gender based violence and to know about gender violence in India. At the same time, uh, I will sort of uh, explain to you what are the laws against sexual violence, rape, molestation, sexual harassment at workplace, dowry related, related deaths and harassment, domestic violence, trafficking, acid attacks, honor killings um, and sex selective abortion and then how women are vulnerable to it. Gender based violence is one of the most serious and socially tolerated forms of the violence prevent in the world. It is common and persistent challenge in India linked directly to the patriarchy and its foundational belief that men have the privilege and the power to inflict violence upon women. It is rooted in women's subordination, it is linked both to the institution of the patriarchy at the same time the concept of the masculinity that a real man is one who inflicts violence against women. Now gender based violence is a major obstacle in women's enjoyment of their human rights and fundamental rights as granted by the Indian constitution. The term gender based violence is used to distinguish violence that targets individual or groups of individual on the basis of their gender from other forms of violence by individuals and collective. It includes acts that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual or psychological harm. A threat of such acts, coercion and deprivation of the liberty are also forms of the gender based violence. Such gender based violence might occur within the family, in the community, during peace times or the time of conflict or by the state agents. It may be pertained by the family members, friends, strangers or intimate partner, partner including husband. While violence is a traumatic experience of anyone, men, women or children, gender based violence is predominantly inflicted by men on women and girls by reasons of their gender. It impacts women's dignity, security, sexuality, reproductive capacity and their right to control over their own body or autonomy as apart from their overarching impact on physical and mental health of women. Gender based violence stems from the power inequality between men and women and you would see that uh, how socio-economic, culture and structural inequalities uh, you know operates in it. So gender based violence both reflects and reinforms inequalities between men and women as a result we see women keep pro compromising in the health, dignity, security, autonomy and uh, of its victims and it encom encompasses a wide range of human rights violation. Gender based violence is phrased predominantly but not exclusively by the women and girls. Men and boys too are sometimes targeted for gender based violence though the extent to which gender, gender based violence impacts them is not clearly known. Violence against lesbian, gays, bisexual, transgender people is an illustration of how gender based violence also results from the tension between the mainstream and alternative understanding and practices related to the sexuality. While acknowledging the prevalence of the gender based uh, violence against the member of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community in India and the serious human uh, rights violation perpetuated on the member of the community, 
So, uh, you know, uh, one has to also understand this aspect very categorically. Uh, let me explain to you the categories of the gender based violence. Now, violence in the family, uh, which can be also gender based violence, such as a domestic violence, sexual violence, uh, sexual abuse of the children in the household, dowry related violence, rape, incestual rape by the uh, family members, honor crimes, sex selective abortion, and female infanticide feticide, female genital mutation, uh, um, FGP, and other traditional practices that are harmful, violence against lesbian, bisexual, transgender people, and violation of sexual and reproductive rights are some of them. Now, violence in the community, including rape, sexual abuse, sexual harassment at workplace, and the other public places acid throwing, witch hunting, sati, honor crimes, trafficking in women and children, forced prostitution, violence against women with disabilities, communal violence, violence against Adivasis and Dalit women. These are some of the forms of the violence which one has to understand. These are these falls in the categories of the violence, right? Now violence perpetuated or condemned by the state. It includes including the custodial rape, torture and killings, gender based violence in the militaries, militarized context, violence against women migrant workers, refugees and internally displaced persons, communal violence and other contexts of the mass crime. Sexual violence for instance rape, molestation, sexual harassment at workplace. Historically, women have been perceived as a repository, chastity, virginity, modesty and honor. Patriarchal control over women including through sexual violence has been exercised and justified in the name of protecting the honor of the family or the community. This notion has led to the targeting of women's bodies through sexual violence to shame and subject, subjugate the woman her family, her community. Equally, this has served to, the, to justify the regulation of women's freedom, choice and the imposition of the dress code. Sexual violence and rape are tools by which power is exercised to maintain an unequal status quo in society that privileges men over women. These ideologies shapes the structure of the family, the community and the state. It combines with casteism and communalism to, re, to produce subordination of one community by the other. Through rape and other forms of sexual violence have been rampant and uh, you know uh, it is increasing. This issue gained international visibility with the brutal gang rape and the murder of the young woman on the moving bus in 2010. And I am here mentioning the Nirbhaya case of the 2012 which had happened in Delhi. This led to the law reforms on the rape and the other sexual offence. Now dowry related deaths and the harassment and statistics are not required to establish this persistent disturbing and increasing presence of the dowry as a cause of the homicide, suicide, harassment of the young men. This is because many of these deaths and the harassment go unreported or uh, are classified under deceptive providence such as accidental death. A dowry motivated killing in the October 2012 that shocked the country um, and I am just uh, giving here uh, one of the case here, case study. That of the uh, Pravartika Gupta, a 25 year old technology graduate who was born to death in her bedroom along with her 13 months old child. The young mother and the child were killed by her husband and uh, in-laws over a dowry dispute. The woman's parents had agreed to pay rupees you know 10 lakhs and the Honda city car for the husband's parents while they were uh, struggling to make the payment the husband's family had allegedly demanded the purchase of the flat for them. 
The law related to dowry, for instance, Dowry Prohibition Act of 1961 has been made stringent for this reason. Accidentally, um, uh, you know, the section 498A and section 304B of the Indian Penal Code helped to address the issue of the dowry harassment and dowry motivated murder respectively. The rising number of the cases of the dowry harassment indicates that the stringent laws and sustained campaign against the dowry which was started in 1980s onwards have had a legal effect in arresting this heinous crime against women which is practiced across caste, class, religious and educational divides in India. However, it is important to remember that all incidents of the violence against women within the home are not necessarily dowry related. Feminist lawyer also point out that the woman's family is responsible for getting her married in the first place with or without dowry instead of supporting her uh, to study and work and for not allowing her to return home from her marital home even when she faces acute harassment due to the dowry or other reasons. The patriarchal perspective of the marriage as an aid and all of the woman and the belief that the rightful place for the death of the woman as her husband plays uh, and you know uh, with increasing consumerism you know have uh, fueled the phenomenon of the woman facing the death and the violence and the harassment in their marital homes. And domestic violence therefore is one of the uh, uh, significant issue to be also raised, right. Uh, on the domestic violence that you know NFHS uh, has conducted uh, 125,000 uh, interview across the 20th states and the national capital uh, in 2005 and 6 and you see the shocking figures has come out incidents and categories in which you would see 40 percent of the Indian women have experienced the domestic violence some point in their married life 37 percent of the ever married women have experienced spousal, physical or sexual violence and 16% of the women have experienced spousal emotional violence. One in the 10 wives or the 10% have experienced sexual violence like marital rape on at least one occasion injuries caused for instance among all ever uh, married women who reported ever experienced physical or sexual violence 36% reports cuts, worries and 9% uh, reports eye injuries, sprain, dislocation on bones, 7% reports deep wounds, broken bones, broken teeth or the other serious injuries and 2% reports serve bones. So you would see that what kind of violence women go through. So correlation between violence and the years of the marriage. An overwhelming majority of the women who reported domestic violence were first assaulted by the husband less than two years within their marriage. So according to the figures, 62% experienced physical or sexual violence within the first two years of the marriage while 32% experienced violence in the first five years. And seeking help only one is the four abused women seek help to try and end the violence made out to them by their husband. So only 2% of women who faced the domestic violence sought intervention from the police. A large majority of the women who have experienced sexual violence but not physical violence have never told anyone about the violence. 85% are like that and only 8% uh, have ever sought help. Abuse uh, you know women most of often seek help from their own families. So perception among the women is that nearly 55% think that spousal abuse is warranted in a several circumstances. 41% of the women thought that husband were justified in slapping their wives if the latter showed you know, disrespect to their in-laws. 35% of the women though, they deserve brutal beating at the hands of their spouse if they neglected doing the household chores or looking after their children. 
So, perception among the men is that when one is looking at this whole discourse, nearly 51 percent of the 75 per thousand Indian males surveyed and think hitting or beating their wife is acceptable for certain reasons, particularly if she disrespect her in-laws. A smaller number think bad cooking or refusing sex are reason for physical assaulting their wife. The Protection of Women from the Domestic Violence Act which came into existence PWDVA was enacted in 2005 to address these issues. Now trafficking also is very uh, uh, important to understand and a transit point of the woman and the girl traffic to the other countries as well as the major distribution, uh, dis destination for trafficked women and girls. The forced labor is an estimated 20 to 65 million citizens constitute India's largest trafficking problem. India remains the main receiving country in the South Asian region for victim survival of the trafficking. India's trafficking patterns indicate that 90 percent of the trafficking is a domestic with only 10 percent taking place across international borders and uh, uh, borders and the most it, um, disadvantaged social uh, economic strata including the lowest lower caste are among the vulnerable which is a 8 percent. Those at the risk of being trafficked include women and girls living away from the uh, from the gender you know uh, uh, from the families, those living in the rural poverty, slums, brothels, on street, physically and mentally challenged person, those facing the stigma due to the abuse, those in the context of ethnic and communal violence, and you would see the gender-based violence how it operates. So every year thousand of women and the girls are bought and sold, uh, trafficked, drug, abducted, assaulted, forced to live, work in exploitative survival or slave like condition with the little bargaining power. So over forms of the violence including rape, torture, deprivation of the liberty, forced labor, forced marriage are often perpetrated against girls who seek to assert their rights. All the provision on trafficking existed in the IPC for many decades. These are amended into 2013 and the offense were elaborated upon to reflect ground realities and the complex practices involving a nexus of the person within and outside the country and you would see that section 370, section 370A of the Indian Penal Codes which falls under that. So additionally the Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act of the 1956 also addresses the issue of the trafficking. Now the acid attack also is one of the gender based violence uh, in which the acid attack against the adolescent girl, young women in India have been regularly reported in the media and it is increasing uh, so in the recent years. However, in, uh, India did not have the official statistics or any systematic record on the issues until February 2013 when it was recognized as a specific offense in the Indian Penal Code section 326A uh, and B. A study conducted by the Cornell University in January 2011 uh, said that there was 153 attacks reported in the media. Uh, in 1999 to 10 and 11, the campaign and struggle against the acid attack, a civil society network has compiled a list of 56 cases in Karnataka alone in, and it was between in 1999 and 2007. According to Acid Survivor Foundation of India, acid violence cases in India could range between 100 to 500 in a year. Uh, 11 years and acid attacks were recognized as a specific offense in the IPC in 2013 under section 326A and B of the Indian Code and I would like to mention it here um, particularly uh, you know the Burma committee uh, report which emerged after the Nirbhaya case uh, significantly contribute and mentioned about the acid attacks in India. The growing acid attacks in India. So uh, here I would cite some uh, case studies for you. Uh, 
um, that the ASIC attacked survivor Lakshmi in the 2009 as a Lakshmi was 15 years old girl, walked from her home to her workplace, a bookshop where she worked as a part-time uh, salesperson. She heard her name being called out and turned to see who the caller was. She looked at two people on the motorbike and walked towards them. The girl on the uh, you know, is a familiar and the man riding the bike is known to her. Uh, he wanted to marry her and uh, she had declined as she reaches them the girl hurls acid on her uh, you know uh, her face her chest and arm were burned beyond recognition and she was in a tremendous pain after uh, several painful corrective surgery Lakshmi has partially healed and now spearheaded a campaign to assist acid survivor based in Delhi she filed a public interest litigation in the court and asking for the law that provides exemplary punishment for the acid attack on the girls and a sound rehabilitation scheme for the victim. The petition resulted in several groundbreaking orders by the Supreme Court to regulate the sale of the acid and setting minimum compensation for the acid survivor. And uh, honor killings are also there, honor crimes recent uh, years have been witnessed bits of the attacks and the killings in the country based on the perpetrator's notion that the victim has to be has brought a dishonor to the family and the community and the feminists have been questioning this debate whose honor ultimately so honor crimes are directly mostly at young women and the girls but also young couples who choose intercaste and interreligious marriage they are punished because they are perceived to have crossed social boundaries or transgressed social norms and perpetuated mostly by their male relative. So the notion of the izzat or the honor um, and its contribution to the social and ideological context of the violence against women, particularly in the marriages of the choice, has been elaborately discussed in the feminist by the feminist researcher. And one can always go and uh, look those debates. So honor crimes are often underreported and are classified as a accident or the suicide, making it difficult to understand the magnitude of the crime in India. So no official statistics or these crimes are available at the national level as it is not specific offense under the Indian criminal law. So majority of this killing takes place in the agrarian states of Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan and uh, eventually it is spreading uh, in other progressive states like Kerala and Maharashtra too. So where uh, land ownership and caste together helps feeling and honor culture by maintaining the caste and gender hierarchies. Female sex selective abortion again uh, in India is uh, the population is a very high. The adverse uh, child ratio has existed and one would see that the reason is the choice for the male child. So this unequal male female sex ratio in India is resulted of the several practices, selective elimination of the female fetus through the abortion, selection of male embryo at the preconception stage uh, and as well as you know the practices of female infanticide is there. So while the focus of the public intervention on the sex ratio figures that there are merely a symptom of the larger problem of the gender inequality discrimination against women in Indian society and the low, uh, and the low social status of the women and the girls. So role played by increasingly unethical commerce driven medical establishment cannot be understood. And sex selective determination uh, uh, followed by the sex selective abortion is a thriving business and grown over rupees you know 100 crore industry there has been mushrooming and ultrasound scanning centers as well as the mobile sex selection clinics that drive uh, into almost any village or neighborhood essentially the devalued status of the women's cause the demand the medical commerce then supply society with the easy technology to act on its anti-female basis uh, I would just cite here one of the honor killing case. Uh, Wade Ballman uh, was a 32 year 
medical practitioner from Kathal district or Mathur village of Haryana on 22nd July 2009. He was on his way to his, uh, to his wife Sonia, her parental home to take her back. In the middle of his journey, he was murdered in the Jin village of Sangwal uh, village, Jin district of the Sangwal village. Sonia and Vedpal were married under the Hindu Marriage Act, which did not have any legitimacy in the eyes of the community. However, when he was lynched by a mob uh, in his in-laws village, he was accompanied by the police bodyguard and the Punjab and high, Haryana High Court uh, warrant officer. He was first pulled to the terrace in Sonia's house and strapped. Later, his chest and face was bitten in, uh, with the sticks. Stickles and uh, scuds were used to tear, uh, to tear open his shoulder and neck. They had been uh, bitten up him until they were assured that he was dead. The reason for the killing Ved Palman was that though the people, a couple belonged to the different Godra, Sonia was a uh, Banwal Godra, they both were Jats. The, um, the Banwal uh, Khapanchet says that the Godras of the newlyweds were different. They both were from a different village. It was not intercaste marriage, however, they broke the norms of the village. And uh, it is uh, because of the Bhai Chara, the fraternal neighborhood for the village between the two villages were challenged. The Khap is found uh, on the idea of the brotherhood and proposes the notion that the marriage cross caste has to be restricted. People who belong to the same Godra of the same caste should not get married and so on. And it is also argued that even if the Godras vary, marriage within the nearby village has to be stopped. Such marriages are deemed and, uh, you know, uh, in uncalcul uh, and then, uh, however, the Khab do allow marriages due to the lack of the girl from the uh, different Godras. And according to the Prem Chaudhary, conventional marriages are regulated through the culture notion as a izzat. Aiki, Biradari and Bhaichara. If anyone violates such a prohibition, conventional practices such as Khap are deployed to control such deviant moves and preserve the uh, dictates of the patriarchal caste bound community. For instance, one of the head of the pancha, uh, Khap Panchat, Paramjit Banwal, declared that and I quote for, uh, his statement, we will never tolerate any dishonor or violation of caste tradition. According to the Kha Panchat, Sonia and Vedpal violated the dictates of the communities because they were siblings to some extent. It is therefore condemned that the people who belong to the same clan like Sonia and Vedpal should not indulge in such deviant acts. The Kha also concluded that uh, such an alliance affect the families as well. Therefore, marriages that happen beyond the rule of the Kaap are condemned as a crime. And Paramjit Banwal asserted that if young people live in our society, they will have to adhere to uh, follow our usual problems. Such relationships are unacceptable at any cost. Jot honor is a supreme, must be preserved at any cost. And I can unquote. So therefore, uh, it's important to understand again the vulnerability, while all women are vulnerable to violence, women, girls from minority communities, marginalized groups, underprivileged section of the society are more un un vulnerable because of their lowered socioeconomic status and their reduced power to access the negotiate with the system of the law and justice. This includes, you know, uh, the face uh, 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 who face physical, mental disability, women from the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, religious minority, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender communities, and the women and young girls, trafficked women and women in prisons. So the intersection of the gender with the variables such as caste, class, region, religion, disability, sexuality, profession, political beliefs results in multiple disadvantage and varied forms of the disempowerment rendering women's experience less visible and their quest for the justice is more challenging. 
I would like to conclude this lecture by saying that in this lecture we got to know about what is gender based violence, how the categories of the gender violence and its forms, multitude of the gender balance violence in Indian society works and operate. At the same time, we also learned that how the various laws operates related with the sexual violence, rape, molestation, sexual harassment at workplace, dowry related deaths, how it is happening, do domestic violence, trafficking, acid attacks, honor killings, sex selective and how women are vulnerable to it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.